So thanks for the invitation. Um, and, and I think uh, Mary and my presentations, um, uh, I think, butt up against each other well, because I'm not going to talk a lot about our actual implementation strategies, which is good, because many of those are very similar to what St. Jude has done. What I want to talk to you about um, is some of the data that we have generated um, that, that really focus on the outcomes of a pharmacogenetic implementation. Um, I'll just run through this real quickly. Uh, I think this is a cartoon that Bill Evans and I created in a review article we wrote in 2001, and I keep using it because it's, I think, still relevant. And the, and the whole concept of pharmacogenetic testing is that we could go from a situation where, um, is there a pointer? I should use this. We can go from a situation where we have um, people who we treat in a similar or common way um, when we know that they are different, we have people who respond well to a drug, people who don't respond well to a drug, and people who get toxicities either due to excessive concentrations um, or some other cause, um, HLA being a very uh, common cause of non-concentration uh, related toxicities. And so our goal is to put these people in these categories before we give the drug rather than after we give the drug. Um, so we're funded by uh, an, an NIH network that's called IGNITE, which stands for in Implementing Genomics into Practice. And so this was not just a pharmacogenetics RFA. Um, it was an RFA written to uh, fund groups that were implementing genomic medicine, so any sort of uh, genomic testing into clinical practice. And the primary goal was to help understand what are those challenges of implementation, um, getting something on the pathology report so that you can order the test. And so there are many challenges. I've, um, and these are the six groups that are currently funded. I have highlighted three of them in red because all three of us are doing pharmacogenetic testing um, as our primary uh, as our primary effort. Uh, we additionally have affiliate members. And I think there are 17 affiliate members, 16 of them, their primary focus in, is in pharmacogenetics. So all of that just to say that this is my argument that in the U.S., aside from cancer genomics, pharmacogenetic testing really is sort of the, the most active area of research um, in genomic medicine. And there's also a website for the IGNITE network, and it's shown here, and it has a toolbox on there. And so the toolbox has um, many of the things that people might need. So um, the clinical decision support alert, so the wording of those. Um, so many of the kinds of things that, that might be helpful if you're trying to implement and, and again, because the network is so active in pharmacogenetics, most of the tools in the toolbox um, apply to pharmacogenetics. <clears throat> so um, what I'd like to do is, rather than tell you about our implementations per se, really tell you about the outcomes of the implementation um, that we have done at UF Health. Uh, and I'll focus on two, CYP2C19 and clopidogrel, and CYP2D6 and opioids. And um, some of our speakers early today gave us some sort of background on those, so I can um, zing through the background. So CYP2C19, a gene with common um, both gain of function and loss of function variation, the STAR2 allele, um, very common in the population. We collapse these into these phenotypes. Um, this is the um, CPIC nomenclature, and so um, this is a gene where if you looked in the literature um, over time, there's been very diverse use of terms, and so um, CPIC, I think, has been really helpful in helping to um, sort of harmonize the, the use of terminology as it relates to the um, genotype-inferred phenotype. Um, so metabolism of uh, clopidogrel, as one of our previous speakers highlighted, is um, it's a prodrug. It has to be bioactivated. There's two steps. cyp 19 is the most important of the genes or the proteins involved in that. And um, we have common loss of function variation. We talked about that earlier. And there's really a lot of evidence that in STAR2 carriers, so the most common loss of function allele, again, um, about 30% of whites, a little bit higher in blacks, um, and up to 70% in Asians, that those individuals have reduced generation of the active metabolite, which makes sense from this cartoon, um, reduced antiplatelet activity when measured via ex vivo platelet reactivity testing, um, and increased risk of major adverse cardiovascular events after a percutaneous coronary intervention. 
Um, these are the CPIC guidelines, which were originally written in 2011 um, and updated in 2013. We haven't been updated since then because really nothing has changed. Again, in a, an acute coronary syndrome or a PCI patient, with a CYP2C19 genotype, the guidelines recommend that in a loss of function carrier, so an intermediate metabolizer or a poor metabolizer, that an alternative antiplatelet therapy is used. Um, in the gain of function, we don't really recommend anything different for clopidogrel, um, but that's not true for all drugs for this gene. So um, we began preparing for our clinical implementation in 2011 and launched in June of 2012. And so this is just a, a web page really announcing uh, the launch of that. And so in the beginning, we were doing genetic testing in every patient who was coming to the cardiac catheterization lab. Um, we then switched that um, once we really made it truly clinical and we weren't paying for the genetic test. Um, we switched about a year, year and a half later um, to individuals who got a PCI. So um, we published a paper on our experience after a year. We documented we could implement clinically. We documented that physicians would order the test. They would change the drug based on the test. So that was all good. But then we really had the question, does it matter? Um, does it matter clinically? And so when we looked at our data uh, in our patients after about the first two years of experience, um, we had pretty good evidence that it did matter. And so. Um, this is from about 400 patients, and what we show here is um, in this dotted line, the individuals who had a loss of function allele but continued to receive clopidogrel. So this is, we would have recommended against this, but um, the physicians, for whatever reason, continued with clopidogrel. They did significantly worse than those who had a loss of function allele and did not uh, get clopidogrel. They got an alternative antiplatelet shown in the solid line. Um, and what is shown in this uh, heavy dotted line is the individuals who did not carry loss of function but got clopidogrel. So clearly differences um, and improvements in outcomes uh, in those individuals who um, got uh, an alternative therapy rather than clopidogrel. And so this is um, a major adverse cardiovascular event, so death, stroke, and heart attack. Um, the first thing that I will point out is that these events occur very early in therapy. So most of them have occurred within the first two months, which is the high-risk period um, after a PCI. Um, and from an economic perspective in the U.S., Medicare, which is the um, major provider of the national provider of health care for the elderly, which many of these patients um, would fall under Medicare, will not pay for a readmission in the first 30 days for certain um, indications. One of those is somebody has a heart attack and they get readmitted in the first 30 days, Medicare won't pay a penny for the readmission. So, um, so we have some very nice economic data which will have been presented at a meeting and will be published soon, but I think probably not hard to see that um, a, a readmission costs about $30,000. Um, and so you can do a lot, of, a lot of genetic testing to prevent these events. So our data at University of Florida really did suggest that genotype-guided approach um, to an antiplatelet therapy post-PCI could reduce death, heart attack, and stroke. Um, but cardiologists are a tough crowd, and that wasn't good enough. So, um, so we then, because people said, well, it's not randomized controlled trial, and it's only one place. So we said, OK, um, challenge accepted. Um, and so it turns out that there were a number of centers across the U.S. that had implemented in a very similar manner. And so as part of the Ignite Network, with both our funded groups and the affiliate members, um, had a collaborative effort that we led from UF that included seven academic medical centers that had implemented pharmacogenetic testing in this setting. Um, and so um, we had nearly 2,000 individuals, um, much like our data at UF, about 30% carried the loss of function allele. Again, exactly what you would expect um, in a population which um, is mostly white and African ancestry. Um, in this, uh, in this uh, cohort, about 40% continued to get clopidogrel despite that being uh, recommended against. 60% got alternative therapy. So one of the things I'll point out here is that this really does show that physicians will use the information. So if we look in those who did not have a loss of function allele, 
alternative therapy was only 15%. So clearly there were um, many, many physicians who were using the genetic information uh, to change therapy if you just compare the differences in the use of alternative in our non-loss of function versus loss of function carriers. Um, and, and most often the alternative therapy was Prasagrel. And so again, significant differences um, between use of alternative therapy, uh, again, documenting really the uptake uh, by and large for this um, by the physicians. Um, this is a, an event curve rather than a survival curve. Again, MACE, um, stroke, death, and MI. And just like we saw at UF, those individuals who were loss of function and got clopidogrel had significantly higher rate of events than those who had a loss of function allele and got alternative therapy. Um, this is where those who were non-loss of function fell. Um, the majority of those, like I showed on the previous slide, got clopidogrel. So you can see um, then the differences in clopidogrel and loss of function and non-loss of function. Um, again, oops, this, these are not randomized controlled trial data. And so, you know, one of the arguments is, well, there's just something different about the people who got clopidogrel with a loss of function allele versus those who got alternative. Um, and so uh, doing propensity scoring and other statistical methods to try to control for that as best we can. Um, we then tested and, and found, an, in terms of the hazard ratio, very similar to many of the meta-analyses um, that had looked at this previously, about a twofold increased risk for major adverse cardiovascular events for loss of function carriers if they got clopidogrel versus didn't cl get clopidogrel. No difference. Um, in those who got alternative therapy with loss of function versus non-loss of function. So again, not randomized controlled trial evidence, but we think um, pretty strong evidence arguing for the clinical outcome benefits of a genotype-guided approach that's actually clinically implemented. So to summarize, um, we have data from seven institutions in the U.S. with nearly 2,000 patients that shows that you can implement clinically, um, that it's feasible to do, that physicians will use the CYP2C19 genotype to guide their antiplatelet therapy decisions, but most importantly that uh, a genotype-guided approach appears to reduce uh, the incidence of MACE in patients who are undergoing a PCI. Um, I'll jump now to CYP2D6. Again, we talked a little bit about this gene earlier today. Uh, again, a gene that has common um, loss of function uh, variation as well as gain of function. I keep thinking this has a pointer. Um, so in this case, the star 3, 4, and 5 are examples of loss of function alleles. There are also reduced function alleles, a, a very complex gene as was noted previously. Um, again, we collapse these into phenotypes with the ultra-metabolizer phenotype resulting in those who have a duplication or multiplication um, of a fully functional allele. Um, so the frequency uh, in the population, uh, 5 to 10 percent are poor metabolizers. Another um, up to 10 percent are intermediate metabolizers. 1 to 2 percent carry um, those duplication or multiplication that make them ultra-metabolizers. So somewhere around 80 percent or so um, are normal function, or 20 percent where you might have action. Um, however, uh, as was also mentioned before, CYP2D6 is one of those um, proteins that's very susceptible to enzyme inhibition, very potent enzyme inhibition. So there are a number of strong inhibitors. The Food and Drug Administration has categorized um, enzyme inhibitors as um, strong, moderate, and weak on the CYP2D6 protein. Um, and so many that are either strong, fluoxetine being an example, um, or intermediate fluvoxamine be an example. The, the strong inhibitors are viewed as basically phenoconverting to a poor metabolizer, basically wipes out CYP2D6 function, uh, and the intermediate metabolizers reduce protein function um, to about half. So um, we did a, a pragmatic trial um, with opioids, and uh, you saw this cartoon uh, in a different format earlier, but again, codeine is a prodrug that has to be bioactivated to morphine, and CYP2D6 is the only pathway that this can occur through. And so people who lack uh, CYP2D6 can't bioactivate um, to morphine, and then its subsequent active metabolites, 
Alternatively, those who are ultra metabolizers can generate excessive amounts of morphine. Um, other opioids where um, this is important um, are tramadol, which has a very, very similar story to codeine. Hydrocodone and oxycodone, a little more confusing in the literature. Clearly, CYP2D6 is important, but um, unlike tramadol and codeine, which have um, really no analgesic effect, these, as parent drug, do have some analgesic effect. And so um, we, uh, as I mentioned, did a pragmatic trial, um, and uh, we took the CYP2D6 genotype, but we also took into account uh, the enzyme inhibitor interaction, so we incorporated the two of those to arrive at a CYP2D6 phenotype. Um, so we had poor metabolizers and intermediate metabolizers, uh, and whether it was for oxycodone, hydrocodone, tramadol, or codeine, we recommended alternative therapy. Um, in ultra-rapid metabolizers, we also, but for a different reason, recommended alternative therapy. And then in the, in the normal metabolizers, we uh, did not recommend any changes. And, and so these are unpublished data, but will be presented at ASCPT in a few weeks, and the, and the abstract has been published. So we enrolled 480 patients from our primary care setting, and these were individuals who had at least three months of chronic pain. We randomized them to uh, genotype-guided versus usual care in a two-to-one fashion. Um, and uh, we collected baseline and three-month patient-reported outcomes of pain and, and a variety of other measures using a set of tools called the PROMISE measures, which are NIH-developed uh, patient-reported outcome tools. Um, so again, this was a pragmatic design. We did not mandate that the physician do anything with the genotype data. Um, and just to highlight the level of pain, the average pain score in these patients, or the median pain score, was 6.7. So indeed, patients who um, had a fair level of pain, 6.7 out of 10. Um, so we did the CYP2D6 genotype, which is a little more complicated because you have to do not only the SNP testing, but the copy number variation. That was reported in the electronic health record, um, typically with about a seven-day uh, seven turnaround time. As I mentioned, we considered the moderate and strong inhibitors, um, and so that ended up converting a fair portion of our patients into PMs and IMs, and I'll show you those exact numbers. Um, we have a, um, like St. Jude, we have a, a second year pharmacogenomics residency for pharmacists, um, and so our PGY2 resident did consult notes for these patients, um, re making recommendations in anyone who was a UMPM or IM, but then up to the physician whether they wanted to uh, adopt changes. Um, and so these are our data. So, so our primary hypothesis was that in, in IMs or PMs who were getting tramadol or codeine, um, and codeine use is falling off very rapidly in the United States, but tramadol is very commonly used, um, that we would see differences. Uh, we, we wouldn't expect much analgesic efficacy from them, so improvements in um, pain scores and so uh, we did a variety of uh, pain scores, least being the least pain they experienced in the previous seven days, now being the, the pain they were experiencing at that moment, worst was the worst pain they had in seven days, average was the, what they would say is their average pain in the previous seven days, and then we created a composite of now worst and average. Um, and so you can see that in um, all of these different pain rating scales, those in the genotype-guided group shown in black did uh, numerically better, um, and in many cases significantly better, than those who had usual prescribing, so in the usual care arm. So we presented these data at our network, and, um, and uh, actually our NIH program officer said, oh, well, that's lovely, but they knew they were getting genotyped, so maybe they just thought they were doing better because they were getting genotyped. So we said, well, that might be true. Um, oh, let me back up. So another thing in pain is that um, a 30% reduction in pain is considered sort of the, the marker. So if you're trying to get an analgesic approved, you have to document 30% reduction in pain. Uh, in our genotype guided group, 23% saw a 30% reduction in pain. None of our control patients um, had a 30% reduction. Okay, so back to this may all be placebo effect because they just knew they were um, getting better care because they were getting genotyped. And so we looked at that in our normal metabolizers who also were getting genotyped. And while they could have access to their genetic information, um, most of them, I think, probably 
uh, didn't know that they didn't have that they had a genotype we weren't making changes on, um, and we see really no differences. So the genotype guided arm had the same level of pain um, as our control arm. So. Um, this is one of several pieces that we would use to dismiss that it's a placebo effect um, and that it's really uh, due to the drug therapy changes that were made um, in those who had actionable genotypes. Um, in this case, no differences uh, between the two groups in the percent of patients with a 30% reduction in pain. So then we were really interested in looking at hydrocodone and oxycodone. Again, the role of CYP2D6 as it relates to analgesia um, in the literature is a little more confusing. And it was very striking. Oxycodone really looked just like tramadol and codeine in terms of what we were seeing in the pain scores. And so when we roll those in together, now tramadol, codeine, um, and hydrocodone, um, we see significant differences in basically all of our pain rating scales um, in terms of a genotype-guided approach uh, leading to uh, improvements in their pain control. However, for oxycodone, nothing. Oxycodone basically looks like morphine or other non-CYP2D6 drugs. So, you know, this isn't definitive enough evidence for us to separate oxycodone and hydrocodone, but we think at least does um, suggest that CYP2D6 may be less important in influencing the analgesic effect um, than it is for hydrocodone. So a lot of work to do still to, to tease out um, oxycodone versus hydrocodone. Um, so again, to summarize, um, I think we've shown again, clinical implementation is feasible, uh, and, and our data suggests that a genotype-guided approach has the, the potential to improve care. Um, however, the availability of the genotype at the time of the patient-physician encounter is really critical. So the data I didn't show you is that drug therapy was changed only 31% of the time. And when we asked why it wasn't changed, it was typically because in that three-month window, they hadn't seen the patient again. So normal care is you see a patient, you make a drug therapy decision, and you see them again at some interval. Um, it's not normal, at least in our health system, to see the patient, order genetic tests, get it back seven days later, look at the test, call them up, make a new prescription, say go to the pharmacy and pick up your new prescription. So one of the, one of the things that's very, very clear with implementation is if you expect it to be successful, you can't really change the workflow in the clinical practice setting. Um, and so coming to, you know, coming to the concept of preemptive testing, we were not doing preemptive testing here. We're doing reactive testing based on the drug. But the reality is you've got to have that genetic information in front of the physician when they're seeing the patient um, for it really to work. Um, when we looked, though, at the adherence of the physicians when they made a change, 97% of the time they followed our recommendation. So when they made any drug therapy change, um, they were following our recommendations. And so um, I think really, you know, again, strong, strong evidence that you have to have it in front of them when they're interacting with the patient, um, which in the outpatient setting uh, adds some complexity and really points to um, why a, a, a preemptive approach, if you could figure out how to do that, makes more sense. Um, and also, we really believe critical in, for this gene um, to take into account drug interactions. Um, so with genotype, only 10% of our population were IMPM. When we considered drug interactions, it, it became 30%. Now, this is a population in particular where that's important because a lot of those strong and moderate inhibitors are antidepressants, and a high percentage of our patients um, in this chronic pain cohort are also on, um, on antidepressant therapy. So, um, but, but really critical to consider that. So our next step with this initiative um, is in our UF um, system. Uh, and so one of our goals is what we call a learning health system where we sort of take what we learn in our implementations and then try to use this more. Um, so opiate addiction is a huge problem in the United States, which means that pain management um, is, is sort of this scary place for many physicians. And, um, and there is a lot of evidence that um, post-surgical pain management uh, leads to uh, opioid, opioid persistent use. So, um, so there was a paper published in JAMA Surgery in the summer showing in outpatient surgical procedures, about 6% of patients were continuing with persistent opioid use at six months. 
Um, and so I think surgeons in particular, they're surgeons, they don't necessarily want to be dealing with pain therapy, um, but recognize that they um, are in some ways contributing to uh, the opiate addiction issues. And so we're going to be implementing in our, um, uh, our arthropast- arthroplastic surgery patients, um, knee and hip replacement surgery, uh, a genotype guided approach. And in patients who are normal metabolizers, the primary drug that will be recommended is tramadol. Um, and, uh, you know, so the hope is better pain control, but uh, also hopefully less of what we call schedule two opiate use. So this is a really nice model because in surgical patients, at least in the U.S., there are typically two visits before surgery. One is when a decision for surgery is made, and then a second visit, which has to be within a month of the surgery, where um, they do a variety of sort of preoperative tests, and this is where the prescriptions um, for their pain medication, their postoperative pain medication are provided. So we will enroll them at their first visit when a decision for surgery is made. It gives us a window to get the genotype back so that the genotype will be available at the time of the second visit when they're making the decision about pain therapy. So our surgeons are really, really excited about this because this is just a bothersome spot for them, um, the pain management part. Um, so we're excited and we're going to be launching that in May. Um, And speaking, though, to the use of concomitant medications or um, use of other drugs that have um, the potential to be guided. So we looked in our health system, our hospitals in Gainesville and Jacksonville. And so anybody who had a prescription for tramadol, hydrocodone, or codeine, um, what was their use? Taking out of the picture the the cancer drugs for which there are CPIC recommendations, what was the use of other CPIC drugs in the first year um, after the first uh, incident of use of tramadol, hydrocodone, and codeine? And consistent with, I think, the, the data that Mary showed, um, in this situation, 65% had an additional CPIC drug that was used. Um, we counted PPIs because it's a CPIC coming of age set of drugs. So PPIs are, in fact, the most commonly used um, concomitant medications, but you can see very commonly used um, are SSRIs, simvastatin, tricyclics, clopidogrel, warfarin. Um, so again, really speaking to the use of a panel. So even if you can only be reactive for the first drug, if you have a panel, um, at least you have those data for all of those other drugs down the road. Um, so I think we all continue to believe preemptive is the way to go, but we struggle with how to implement that. Um, and so having a, a, at least a strategy where you have a panel of genes, um, it's very, very clear that the use of subsequent drugs, because these are very, very commonly used drugs, um, will occur with time. So in terms of our lesson learned, um, we, you know, we have a lot of evidence that physicians or prescribers will use genotype, guided, uh, genotype data to guide their treatment decisions, but it really needs to be available at that patient-physician encounter. Um, we also have to provide them clear data to interpret the genotype, and so we are also using things like Mary described with the clinical decision support alerts. Um, we don't even necessarily want them to know what the genotype is. We don't think that's that important. We just need to help them know what to do. Um, patients are also really, really enthusiastic about this. Um, in our outpatient implementation, in our control arm for our pain study, we offer genotyping to be reported into the medical record um, after the trial is done, I think we're at 97% who wanted their genotype done. So the vast majority want to have that information, and the physicians actually said they would not be able, they would not be willing to enroll their patients in a study like this, um, where some patients might go into a control arm if we weren't going to give them the genotype eventually. So a lot of interest, I think, from both the physician and the patient perspective. Um, And again, um, patients with chronic diseases are on a lot of drugs and a lot of drugs that we can um, use genetics to guide. Um, So again, we've um, I'm sure with you uh, two examples where not only have we implemented, but we have data showing improved clinical outcomes, but we have to continue to generate um, that level of evidence because I think much of the community remains skeptical. With that, I will acknowledge Um, all of the people involved as well as our support and thank you.